Hello students, welcome to another lecture video for Comsai 125 operating systems. So we're going to look at a new chapter. In the last video, we talked about um, the process API, where we learn about the different system calls services that are related to process management so this is chapter 6 which is a mechanism entitled mechanism limited direct execution so at this point in our class we know already the importance of virtualizing the CPU because by doing so, it allows the physical CPU to be shared by different processes. Our example last time is the juggler wherein we have several, we have several balls which represents processes and we have two hands to represent the CPU and this is important to achieve uh, what we call time sharing and multi-programming the idea of multi-programming the term itself means that it allows the it allows the operating system to have several jobs in possible jobs in the memory and time sharing allows a single resource to be shared by these processes so if we're going to draw that let's say this is the processor and this is the me memory the CPU so this is the memory and this is the CPU remember these are the two main resources of a computer system multi-programming means we have several jobs in the memory so this can be one two three jobs one two and three and we have a single CPU or a single core here so by doing this we achieve multi-programming and time sharing would mean that at some point in time uh, I forgot to add another part here the OS should also be in the main memory okay. so initially the OS is running in the memory and at some point it has to select which user process will run on the CPU so that's the idea of time sharing and multi-programming so the issue that arises from this setup are the following the first we have the issue on performance how can we implement virtualization without adding excessive overhead to the system in the case of the juggler example that I presented last time it is a hard task it requires skill to be able to juggle three balls what if more balls will be juggled so it really requires skill and that will affect the performance in the case uh, of this illustration here there should be a way to be able to switch from the OS should be there should be a way for the OS to be able to switch or to determine quickly which job will run on the CPU and then the not another issue is control how can we run processes efficiently while retaining control of the CPU so in the illustration that I have here we have user process here this one and this one we need to have some way for the OS to take back control of the CPU I mentioned earlier that at 
initially or at the start of the system the OS will run on the CPU and at some point it will relinquish the control of the CPU to a user process now what if the user process did not release the CPU what will happen so in providing this virtualization this time sharing feature of the operating system we need to address these two issues performance and control and in order to address this we need to require some actually both hardware support and operating system support now I, I'd like you to visualize uh, to remember this diagram here because this will be somehow our main framework when uh, looking at the topics in this chapter so we have the memory we have the CPU and in the memory we have the OS kernel and we have the user processes here so we have this particular separation we'll discuss this more later so the basic technique actually is by uh, direct execution so given this uh, set this previous illustration when we say uh, direct execution we simply run the program or the user process directly on the CPU and this will be the timeline for that for this technique so the first part we have the OS what the part what the OS does is to create a data structure the process list then if you have a user program it will allocate memory for that program and then it will load the program into the memory and it will set up uh, the stack with argument count and an array of strings for the argument vector which are basically the command line arguments then clear the registers and then call the main function of the user program it will execute now and then eventually at the end of the main function we have a return and then after the return the OS will uh, free the memory for the process and then remove the process from the process list so looking back at the previous illustration at some point initially uh, the uh, this step one here is step one two steps one and two here at that point uh, the OS will be running here in the processor so it will do just that and it will create a process here okay? and then transfer control to this process that means it will bring this process one to the uh, processor the OS will uh, relinquish control of the CPU and it will allow the processor to or the pro user process one to run on the CPU and after that after the after the user process one ends then the OS will uh, take back control of the CPU so that is the simple direct execution mechanism if you have other programs then the same process will happen uh, and the point here is you allow whatever program was selected you allow that program to be to complete its execution from uh, until the return statement in the case of a C program so the main disadvantage of this is that without limits on running programs 
the OS wouldn't be in control of anything and thus it would just be a library. What we mean by that is if the only task of the OS is to create the process list, create, allocate the process to a memory, load the program into that memory for that particular process, then jump to the main function of that process, wait until the process completes, and then take control back of the processor, then select the next process to run until completion again. So if the OS is just like that, then it's nothing more than just a library that calls other that calls user that calls the main function or user processes so with this basic direct execution what can we do okay so to address there are actually two problems that we need to address because of the limitation of the direct execution technique. The first one is how do we perform restricted operations? Remember that when an OS loads a user process, it will not execute the selected process, the chosen process, will have full access. So in problem one, we're trying to address or to provide some restrictions on what a process can do. However, if we do that, there are instances when uh, wherein a process will have to perform some uh, restricted operations like performing an I.O. request to the disk, gaining uh, access to more system resources like CPU and such as memory and CPU. How does how do you allocate these resources to a process, a user process? Okay. So, however, if we just let the process do what it wants, as I was mentioning earlier, we will be limited in constructing uh, desirable features like security and protection. So, if we allow this user process one here to be able to do whatever it wants then there will be some problems with that because we cannot implement some security and protection mechanisms so the solution is that we separate the mode of operation of uh, limited uh, or restricted operations to a certain mode and then allow it to uh, to be able to be performed in a certain mode so the solution is to introduce a protected control transfer control transfer happens when we perform a function call or when we execute a job instruction because the instruction pointer or the program counter changes okay. so to achieve this protected control transfer we introduce two modes of operation which actually requires hardware level support these two modes are typically known as the user mode and the kernel mode when a process is in user mode or when uh, yes when a process is in user mode the process will not have full direct access to the hardware resources we actually call these user processes the typical uh, programs without doing any restricted operations 
Now, the kernel mode, on the other hand, uh, is the mode wherein the OS has access to the full resources of the machine. Okay, so we often refer to this as the kernel because it is the uh, somehow the it always exists in the system in the memory. So these are called user processes that runs in user mode and we have the OS we have the OS kernel which runs in kernel mode. Now given this separation, these two modes, the user mode and the kernel mode, how then can a user process perform privileged operations like input output? The answer to that is the kernel performs the operation on behalf of the user process via a system call. So we have a user process that would like to perform some restricted operation. That user process is running in, in user mode, so it cannot perform these restricted operations. What the user process does is to use a system call to seek the assistance of the kernel to perform this restricted operation since the kernel is running in kernel mode. So that's essentially the idea of this operation. The bridge between the user process and the kernel, the kernel which has access to everything, is through a system call. Now let's look into the detail of system calls. Recall that in the previous chapter when we looked at the process API, the functions provided or the API actually involve system calls. Okay. So we have different uh, services like fork and exec which are actually system calls with specific service number. So what is a system call? A system call allows the kernel to carefully expose certain key pieces of functionality to a user process. What are these key pieces of functionality? This includes accessing the file system, creating and destroying processes which we discussed last time, and uh, also we talked about communicating with other processes when we briefly talked about pipes, and then allocating memory. So these are pieces of functionality that a user process will need but it cannot perform directly so it asks the kernel through a system call. Now, how is this implemented? We're going to need some privileged hardware instructions because we cannot just use the ordinary function procedure call mechanism. What do we mean by this? In a typical program without the separation of user mode and kernel mode, we can actually implement the accessing of the file system by just implementing it as a function and then calling that function. But by doing so, allows the user process to access the memory that contains the definition of that particular function. We don't want that, we don't want to enable that because we want to provide some protection. That's why we need to have some privileged hardware instructions to be able to do that, to somehow protect the user process from accessing protected memory areas and performing 
privilege operations. Now let's talk about uh, privilege instructions because to be able to implement system calls, we need, as mentioned, we need to have to use or the hardware should provide some privilege instructions. The first type of instruction is called the trap instruction. Now the trap instruction will uh, jump to the kernel. So at the start of the operate uh, the boot at the start of the boot process of the system, the kernel will be loaded in the memory. So and then uh, from that uh, raise the uh, it will uh, after the trap it will raise the privilege level to kernel mode. So if the kernel is now in kernel mode, the, the privilege level is now in kernel mode, then it can now execute privilege instructions. Now what, what are some of the concrete instructions for the trap instruction? Now since we're using the x86 architecture or x86-64, we actually have the int instruction to do that or the syscall instruction for 64-bit systems and uh, so that's the first instruction which will jump to the kernel and then raise the privilege level of the system to kernel mode and then the kernel can now do its job on behalf of the request of the user process so after completing the job or the request there is also a return from trap instruction. What it does is to return to the calling, so this should be process, return to the calling process, and then it will reduce the privilege level back to user mode. In the case of the x86, we have the IREP instruction or interrupt return instruction and for the x86-64 we have the SysRED instruction. Now we are talking about uh, privilege levels here. What are these privilege levels? On the right you see a figure which actually are concentric rings. Now the computer hardware provides these uh, privilege levels or rings that determines what instructions can be executed at a particular ring and in a way also provides a mechanism of protection in user processes and other important system components. As you can see here, this is in the case of x86 we have what we call the ring zero. So the ring zero is the highest or the most privileged level in the x86. So the kernel actually executes in this uh, privileged level. Then outside of this, we have rings one and two, which are actually used by device drivers. Remember, device drivers are used to interact with the actual devices so it needs to do some privileged operation but not necessarily at the same level as the kernel and the outermost ring which is shown here ring 3 is used for applications and it is the least it has the least privilege level so we can say that in most operating systems user mode will be running in user mode processes will be running in ring 3 and the kernel will be running in a ring 0 how are these set well in the x86 there is a special set of registers control registers 
where it, you set some values to enable the specific privilege level. That's the idea. And we also need to have a another instruction to initialize what we call the trap table which is basically just a support instruction let's continue with the system call uh, now during the switching process so it should be clear to you now that we have a this is the user mode and this is the kernel mode at the hardware level this will be ring 3 based on the previous illustration this will be ring 0 and if you have a user process here and it wants to do some restricted operation like reading the file system it has to use a syscall system call to invoke that and then this is part this is implemented in the kernel okay and then after so the path will be this which is entering the kernel mode and then after the execution of the syscall it will return back to the user process so to be able for the system to be able to implement the syscall we should save enough information or the hardware uh, must save enough uh, information because the trap instruction okay as mentioned here the trap instruction will jump to the kernel and raise the privilege level to the kernel mode so it has to save some or enough information so that it can go back to the user process and what are these information so this include the this includes the program counter and then uh, perhaps with the flags registers and other important registers and then uh, this information which actually defines the machine state of the process the user process which we discussed last time will have to be pushed to a kernel stack which is a data structure this is a per process a per process kernel stack that will be used that is managed by the kernel inside inside it okay, so remember that the kernel the way to represent a process is by uh, the process control block or a thread control block and the kernel maintains a list of these processes process control blocks so one of the fields in this process control block would be the kernel stack so uh, the this data will be pushed to the kernel stack and then this will happen before the trap so the syscall here will have a trap called trap invocation and then after that we are, uh, we are now in the kernel mode doing the syscall and then after that there will be a return from trap instruction so somewhere here this will be the case stack the, the kernel stack okay and then after that it will pop the information back to the hardware registers so that when the 
uh, when the process returns or where, where the, when the trap when the return from trap happens the user process can continue executing where it uh, where it halted during the trap instruction so that's uh, basically the mechanism so what's happening actually here is let's say we have the right sys right system call right let's say you're implementing the right system call now the right system call writes uh, accepts a if we look at the okay let's so right now what we're doing is we're trying to understand how to implement a system call and the basic idea is implementing a system call will require specialized or special hardware instructions like trap and return from trap to be able to switch from user mode to kernel mode because we need to provide some separation between these two in order to provide some protection. Now going back to the right system call, let's say we're looking at the right system call. If you look at the function uh, declaration or function prototype, so it requires a file descriptor, a buffer, and count the number of bytes to precisely to write on the file descriptor so given this system call we're interested in implementing the right system call so what happens actually is at the very end so the the implement in the implementation of the right system call there will be a trap instruction that will uh, do the switching from the user mode to kernel mode and raising the privilege level then transferring to control to the kernel so right is actually uh, the details right is what is exposed to the user process but it's actually the trap that process the execution to the kernel to perform the operation so within the right within this right the implementation of this right function we have a syscall uh, invocation So let's talk about the trap table. What is this trap table? A user process cannot specify the address to jump to in a system call unlike a typical function procedure call. Okay. So and why is that? Well, to provide some protection. How then does the trap know which code to execute in the kernel? So know that we are now in kernel mode. So I, I guess it's best if we have an example. So let's have this syscall demo that asa. So I assume that you've all taken Comsci uh, one three one. So this code should be fami somehow familiar to you. So we have uh, an example assembly code here. <clears throat> so we define uh, this function. Okay, there's subroutine underscore start as global. So the OS will call this later. And when writing a program, we need to have the text section and the data section. Take a look at the call here, syscall and syscall. Okay. So what we're doing here is 
this is a user program syscall demo but we want to write something to the screen to be able to do that we need to uh, this particular user process cannot directly write on the screen it has to request the kernel to write to the screen but we need to pass some information to the kernel to be able to perform that function and that is passed by uh, registers or stack or some uh, memory area so first let's uh, try to uh, run this example so let's say let's compile, assemble this uh, we have to make sure that this is 64-bit executable so we can take a look at the object file generated and then we link this so let's basically specify let's try to specify a uh, name so we have this executable now and then we can run it and hello 64-bit ASM so this is now what happens the process is able to write to the screen by uh, requesting the Linux kernel through this syscall mechanism and then by passing the necessary information to registers so remember the syscall will have a this syscall is the trap instruction right so before going into kernel mode some context will have to be saved by the linux kernel in the per process kernel stack so here we have two example invocation of syscalls the first one is this is for the right system call and the other one is for the exit system call so we usually have to specify a number for the service number here okay and then we have so remember that as shown earlier the right system call has three parameters the first one is the file descriptor which we pass here in the register rdi then we have the uh, buffer where the data will the data to print to the file descriptor will be uh, retrieved and the total number of bytes here. so we have 19 uh, bytes here okay so and then we perform the syscall so this is in assembly code okay but we can do this actually in uh in c okay so the same process can be done but uh yeah, you can try that but you get the idea so you can uh, use the open uh actually not open you can uh, write to the std out let's try this actually i haven't tried it yet but this uh let's try it So let's call the right system call uh, std out file no. Then uh, let's say we have a buffer here. 
right system call will uh, uh, have the buffer as the next parameter and how many bytes do we want to write? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, 11, 12 so let's add a new line character 13 and then we call the exit system call so in this example we have uh, two system calls See if this works. I haven't tried this. I'm doing this on the spot. Uh. Mm -hmm. So we have to include STD Live. As you can see, in this example, we did not use printf, which is the typical way we write C programs. Instead, we directly called uh, the write system call. Okay. We directly called the... Uh, sorry for that. The write system call. And then we... I'll call the exit system call. So I hope that uh, shows, shows the differences or how system calls work and uh, this one also. So it's a very similar code but this one is in assembly and the other one is in C. Okay so let's continue with the slides. So an important structure that we need to study is called the trap table. So we have the trap instruction, we have the return from trap instruction, now we have the trap table. So what is this trap table? Before we proceed to uh, trap tables, let's take a look first as an aside to the interrupt mechanism and hardware. If everything is going well, uh, the CPU will just happily execute instructions. So everything, once the user process is running on the CPU and everything is good, then that process will continue to run on the CPU. But sometimes important events need the, the attention of the CPU. Examples would be uh, a user process divides by zero. So say you write a program and then your program has a bug that such that uh, division by zero is performed. So there should be a way to interrupt the processing and tell the user process, hey, you're dividing by zero, that is not, that is undefined. So that's uh, one particular event. Another would probably I.O. completion. If you're reading from a disk and the read is complete, so you don't want to wait for too long. So you can inform the user process, hey, I'm finished reading this particular disk area. A page fault happens, which we will discuss later when we go to virtual memory. Or a system call is invoked. Invo so we have a user process. So a user process is running in user mode. 
and that user process invoke let's say the right system call so the right uh, system call will uh, switch will trap and switch to kernel mode and then the kernel will execute the operation the right operation on behalf of the user process okay so that's one or a timer has uh, lapsed or has elapsed has completed the amount of time the clock takes it has to do so these events will require the attention of the cpu and in hardware they can be addressed either by polling or via interrupts or some interrupt mechanism and the x86 uses the interrupts mechanism now polling is some kind of an idle loop because there are some hardware architectures that do not provide interrupts but in our case interrupts will be used and these interrupts are identified by the interrupt numbers so we have different interrupt numbers that are assigned to specific uh, events like this example shown here now also in the case of the x86 it has uh, in its documentation it has classified uh, two types uh, two main types of interrupts we have the interrupt and then exceptions now interrupts are asynchronous or asynchronous hardware events like this IO completion uh, the or the, ex, the explicit uh, invocation of the int instruction so that's another uh, cut, uh, that's an example of interrupts uh, the next category or classification is exceptions these uh, exceptions are actually interrupts uh, that happens when error condition when there is an error condition there are actually three types of this we have the traps false and abort traps reported immediately and the process continues execution to the next instruction after the trap so this is act actually uh, the system call is classified under this uh, name trap or exception or if you are debugging the code so it will be interrupt so is also a trap and for faults these are reported immediately a process continuous execution to the specified fault handler so the fault handler will uh, sometimes will not immediately return to the Erring process it will show some message first and then it will require some user intervention whether to proceed or not okay so examples of that would be page faults and division by zero have you tried that dividing by zero your program dividing by zero so actually the compiler will touch that if you have some code like that but sometimes it will not touch that so there should be a handler for division by zero and then we have the abort to which are severe errors so these severe errors are unrecoverable errors usually this is when you see kernel panic in linux the system cannot proceed anymore and the blue screen of death okay, so when you see the in windows when you see the blue screen of death that means you have to reboot your system okay, so that's an abort uh, exception in the classification provided by the x86 uh, processor documentation so going back so that was just an aside just to give you an introduction of the interrupt mechanism in the hardware so the system call uh, needs to access the trap table so a trap table sometimes also called the interrupt vector table or 
the interrupt descriptor table so IVT when you are in real mode in the x86 and IDT when you are in protected mode so this truck table is set up by the kernel at boot time and uh, at this point the kernel has full privilege because the the system is just booting and then the bootloader has transferred control to the kernel the kernel will need to do some initialization in order to prepare the system for further use and one of the steps that must be done by the kernel is to set up this trap table or this interrupt descriptor table I'll show you an example later now the kernel places in the trap table the memory address of the code called the trap handler which will execute when an event generated by interrupts and exceptions occurs and this is identified by an interrupt number the kernel will set the address of the code for the system call as the system call handler sometimes it's called uh, ISR interrupt service uh, routine ISR interrupt service routine to one of the user defined interrupt numbers like in the Linux in the 32 bit we have the interrupt number 80 then the exact or specific operations can be invoked by passing a service number in either the registers or stack as uh, I demonstrated earlier so thus using a number instead of the address to prevent direct memory access so on this in this figure here on the right this is the interrupt vector table when the PC boots so this will be the basically just an area in the memory specific, uh, in the uh, lower area of the memory wherein you supply the supply the address the kernel will actually place the address of the routines here uh, these routines called trap handlers will execute when that particular interrupt is uh, triggered and before we proceed to the demonstration of this uh, trap table let's take a look at this uh, limited direct execution protocol or LDE to illustrate the operation of the different uh, main components when we're doing a limited direct execution remember that initially what we have the basic technique that we have is called uh, direct execution but we know that there is a problem with this uh, direct execution so the first problem that we have to address is how do we perform restricted operations so this is just somehow a summary of what we've discussed so far so we have three main components here we have the OS we have the hardware and we have the program okay, so we have uh, three components then before this happens the bootloader will transfer control to the kernel and so just uh, withdraw the example that we have So this the man at the CPU. Right? So 
have the disk here. Okay. So at the start of this limited uh, should be limited uh, direct execution protocol. Uh, what will happen is a trap table. The trap table will be initialized the the OS kernel because at this point the OS is on the CPU, okay. and then the hardware will remember the address of the system call handler. So this is part of the initialization of the OS. Now af after this, uh, the OS will uh, continue its initialization. What it's going to do is to create a process list. So we have, we can uh, consider these as the process list, these three slots here. Then if we have a program here, let's say, let's call this one, okay. we allocate memory for program. So the OS, since the OS is running here, let's say it allocates this space for this particular program. And then the program will, uh, the, OS, the kernel will load the program into memory. So recall the exec VE example. Okay. So you have the exec VE, so it will load that. So this is now a process. Okay. Then it will set up the user stack with argv and argc. And then it will fill the kernel stack with the registers and program counter. And then return from the trap okay so after this okay, the hardware of course will uh, so this is uh remember this is software the os is software this one is software so we have a return from trap so the hardware will restore the uh registers and the program counter from the kernel stack and then it will switch to user mode and then jump to the main of the program so the at this point at this point the OS will no longer be in the CPU but rather process one will now be running in the CPU because it's now executing the main instruction now after this, the let's say the main program calls or calls a system call, let's say write as I've shown in the in the demo earlier, that write system call will again drop into the OS. And what happens is so from this trap, let's say calling write, the hardware so the, hard, the trap is a hardware instruction. It will save the registers and the program counter to the kernel stack for that particular process. Then switch to kernel mode and then call the system call handler. Okay? And uh, from that, the hardware will now transfer control to the kernel so the kernel will now be in control again so let's say this process issued a write system call so it will trap it will remove this process here and then the os will run on the cpu again okay and then uh there is a service specified by a number let's say one in uh, in the example earlier the right and after doing the work, it will return from the trap, and the same process will happen in the hardware. The registers in the program counter from the kernel stack will be restored to the actual registers and program counter, and then it will switch to user mode and jump back to the restored program counter 
until eventually calling exit and then freeing the processes. So actually this is the uh, very similar example that I've shown earlier. So we have the right here and then we have the exit here. So I just illustrated what happened in if we use the limited direct execution of the direct limited direct execution protocol so that's uh, it now let's take a look at an actual example of this now uh, let's Try, actually I haven't tried this, let's try to look at how um, how the execution of that example that we have uh, will happen in the in GDB so this is the code uh, let's take a look so here so B plus seventy nine. So So here we have the right system call. It's going to be called now. So let's try to look inside it as I so let's see how it's implemented so we have here is some code and we have this jump instruction here just uh, continue with that and then if we move inside this So we now have this, uh, we are now inside the implementation of the uh, right system call in libc and uh, as you can see we have a syscall here and we have a move instruction here, move to AAX which actually tells us that it's calling the uh, system call for the service number 01 which is the right system call so let's uh, continue cni plus but, but you get the idea of of this part here so this is called will actually transfer control to the kernel so the right function that was that we called in the C program within it is wrap the sys call the trap instruction that switches the mode from user mode to kernel mode okay so that's one thing to remember and after this is called it will go back to this uh, instruction so we actually will not supposedly should not be able to uh, look at the actual implementation of the right in the operating system itself okay so i hope you got an idea about that Now, in terms of uh, programming, okay, 
So I have here an example. You can take a look uh, at this GitHub rep that I have for this tutorial. So here we have an example of setting up what we call a group uh, descriptor tables, but this is more on the memory management. We'll focus uh, for now about the interrupt descriptor table, which I actually mentioned earlier. So the interrupt descriptor table will uh, be set up by the operating system and then it will place in what we call trap handlers in this interrupt descriptor table so that whenever an interrupt is triggered the trap handler or the interrupt handler will execute. So I will just leave to you the reading of this material but here you have uh, an example of the different interrupt numbers so yeah you will see this uh, in uh, the github repository so let's take a look at the code the example here so this is this part uh, gdt so let's go inside that folder First, let's take a look at the source code. Okay. So, let's take a look at ISR. So, I mentioned about ISR a while ago. ISR is Interrupt Service Routine. So, here in this example, we have the uh, register uh, structure which will contain the information the state okay. uh, and let's take a look how this is set up okay so isr So this is an example uh, ISR handler okay? so, or the trap handler. Okay, okay so this is the header file for the GDT and the IDT. So you are interested in the IDT, which is almost similar to the GDT. GDT is for memory management and some and setting the protection levels, ring zero, ring one, ring two, or CPL, actually, or CPL. So first, uh, here is we have this is how to set up the interrupt descriptor table and uh, we have uh, this structure here right? uh, tied to the memory setup and then we have some functions here so this so this ISR ISR represent the interrupt handler for each particular interrupt number and okay, let's take a look at interrupt.s so these are so this is the isr it's the common stub right so it traps the part where in the uh, registers are saved okay. and then call the handler and then return to the caller so this is the return from trap instruction here i rep okay. and this is the code that is executed inside the uh, 
the drop handler itself. So let's take a look at the main program here. So what this code does is to invoke uh, the different interrupts, trigger the interrupt, to invoke the interrupts using the int instruction. So 344. So let's try this. Uh, So this is the output of the code fragment which means that the interrupts, these interrupt numbers were actually trigger triggered by invoking the uh, main, uh, the, in by invoking the int instruction in the, via inline assembly in the code. So let's say we want to call interrupt and interrupt three twice. So you can do that. And then should have the okay so you can see now that the interrupt uh, three handler was uh, modified okay. and of course we can uh, we can look at the So this is the code for that. This is the ISR handler. So let's say let's create uh, our own handler. And let's edit the so this is the code that is being called. 
our own uh, trap handler was will be called. So it was not called. Let me check. Let me pause this for a while. Let me check why. Okay, so I think I know the error now. Uh, there's an error in the code uh, here. My handler is not defined, so uh, let's edit that because we did not specify our So as you can see, uh, in this uh, run, we are able to see that we were able to replace the trap handler for interrupts 3 and 4 for other interrupts by, repl by placing in our, by calling our uh, trap handlers. Okay, so we will stop pause here for a while. Okay, so I would like to emphasize that the these operations, this setup is usually done in low-level language like assembly okay so let's move on to the next problem that must be addressed if you want to provide some uh, limited uh, or to provide virtualization of the CPU provide uh, time sharing and the programming so the next Thing that we need to address is how do we switch between processes so when a user process is running on the CPU this means that the kernel is not running so as I, I illustrated in this uh, drawing okay so once the OS has selected a process and it is running on the CPU, the OS is out of the CPU okay. and it's up to the currently running process to give back control to the kernel okay. so that is a problem now how can the OS regain control of the CPU so that it can uh, switch between processes Right. Now, there are two approaches to do this. The first one is via a cooperative uh, approach wherein the OS will wait for system calls so that, of course, when a system call happens, the trap handler for the OS will be, uh, will be called, will be invoked. Okay, so that's one. So when that happens, control is transferred back to the kernel. Or another approach, the non-cooperative approach, which is uh, this one, the OS will take control. So let's first take a look at the cooperative approach for uh, for the kernel to gain back control of the CPU so what it does is to simply wait for system calls the, the user process that is currently running on the CPU okay I'm done I'm going to use this system call 
such that when the trap happens, control will go back to the kernel. Right, so that's the that's one approach. And usually we have the yield system call for that. Uh, in Linux, do we have that system call? Let's try. There's no yield. Maybe I, I, I don't know, but I sh I'm sure there is an equivalent for yield for that for Linux. Okay, but we usually have a yield system call, and we just basically tell the uh, kernel, the user process just tells the kernel, I'm done. So take control of the CPU. The OS then decides to run some other task. Okay? And the application auto transfers control trap to the OS when they do something illegal. So, like dividing by zero or trying to access a memory, so it's page fault. So, uh, the in this approach, the kernel simply waits for traps to happen so that. The trap handler, which is hooked by the kernel, will be triggered. Right? So early versions of this approach are the in the early versions of Mac and uh, Xerox Alto system. Now a main drawback of this approach is that what if a process got stuck in an infinite loop? Right? So there's a bug in the code and the yield call is never made so what happens so you have to reboot okay so that's the problem with this approach some programs you cannot trust all programs to be working correctly there will be always be bugs and these bugs one of which can be an infinite loop so you have no choice the kernel will never gain control of the CPU so you have to reboot the machine so a better approach is to use the uh, to force okay, to force the kernel to take control of the CPU after some time and this is accomplished by a timer interrupt so the timers a hardware component that traces an interrupt every so many seconds so ma many milliseconds which is actually configurable you can set the number of milliseconds and in the x86 this is the PIT or the programmable interrupt timer so how does this work at boot time the kernel sets a timer handler for the timer interrupt then it starts the timer when the timer interrupt so the timer will uh, we have it here so a uh, countdown timer here for example when this timer reaches zero it will generate it will uh, activate the timer interrupt number for there's a timer uh, there's an interrupt number for that it will be raised or it will be activated and what happens is that the currently running process is halted this is what will be done uh, save enough uh, of the state of the halted process and then the timer handler for the timer the timer handler is basically a trap handler or interrupt handler for the timer interrupt Runs the code in the kernel, such as the scheduler, to possibly run a different process. So that's uh, how it's done. So a timer interrupt. Uh, recall our discussion in the previous uh, previously about uh, the interrupt mechanism. So a timer interrupt gives kernel the ability 
to run again on the CPU after a number of milliseconds have passed. So in this approach, the kernel does not wait for the user process to call the yield system call. Whenever the timer reaches, let's say zero, the in timer interrupt will be raised and this will be executed and at this point the kernel can take control of the CPU. In addition to the so what we mean by this is even though let's say we have a process that is that has an infinite loop and it's currently running on the CPU. After some time when the timer expires that the CPU will actually be given to the kernel even if the that process that, that is currently running on the CPU is running in an infinite loop. So this is the advantage of using a timer to allow the kernel to gain control back of the CPU. So when the kernel is uh, now in control then it can do its thing and one component of the kernel is the scheduler which makes decision depending on the scheduling policy which we'll discuss later whether to continue running the current process this means that okay uh, I am now in control should I allow the currently running process to continue or should I switch to a different uh, process given that the kernel now has control okay. and if the decision is made uh, the decision is to switch to another process then there is what we call a context switch the running process will be uh, remove from the CPU and a new process will be placed on the CPU and that's called the context switch. Now lo let's look at the details of the context switch. Now the context switch is a low-level piece of assembly code. Uh, before we proceed to this, let me demonstrate first the timer. Okay. So in this uh, code tutorial, we have this IRQ and IPT. Right. So in this tutorial, uh, we have some discussions about uh, interrupts uh, and poly but I made uh, a general discussion earlier so we can actually uh, place okay, a handler for the timer so that uh, we can capture the can capture the Control. You can gain control whenever the timer expires. Okay, so you can. I will not discuss the details of this, but or perhaps in some other videos. But uh, you can just take a look at the code here. Okay. But let's take a look at how this is implemented. Okay. So. It builds on the previous example so we still have the code here the common stub we have the 
this timer callback is the uh, this is the uh, code that is called or the, the uh, timer handler that is called whenever uh, clock tick happens okay. or the clock tick expires We have here 10 milliseconds as set, right? And then, so we enable the interrupts here, right? And then set the timer. So let's see. So this is the init timer code. Okay. So we call the register interrupt handler. We hook it to IRQ0, interrupt equals line 0. And this is the timer callback. Okay. So every 10 seconds, okay, uh, we should get a clock T. So let's try that. output so you see the clock ticking okay so every time the 10 seconds has elapsed it will output this value so let's try uh, modifying the code and Let's say this increase this to forty. Before we say this, so we have frequency. Still faster. this lower value 
still the same, almost the same frequency. Anyway, uh, I'll just leave uh, this to you to experiment. Okay. So let's go back to the context switch. Okay. The context switch is a low-level uh, piece of assembly code. It's called the context switch uh, code that is used to switch processes. So what are the steps taken by the context switch? So you save a few registers for the currently running process onto the kernel stack. So you have, uh, this include the, some general purpose registers, the program counter, and the pointer to the kernel stack. Then you restore a few registers from the kernel stack of the soon to be executing process and then you switch to the kernel stack for the soon to be executing process so what happens here is by switching uh, kernel stacks uh, the kernel enters the call to the context switch code in the context of the interrupted process so as i mentioned the timer after the expiration of the timer the uh, after the timer has expired right the timer handler will be invoked for sure there will be an interrupted process now that interrupted process the information about the machine state of that process will be saved, will have to be saved to a kernel stack for that process. And then in case the scheduler decided to run a different process, it will look at the it will access the kernel stack of the of the selected process that will be executed and then restore that to the actual hardware registers so remember that this the kernel stack is for uh, execution okay, so for execution then after that it switches to the kernel stack for the soon to be executed so it uses now the kernel stack of the uh, new or the, so the soon to be executing process so two steps here entering in the context of the interrupted process into the context switch code and then returning in the context of the soon to be executing process so in that way the context switch happened because the contexts are stored in the registers okay. so let's take a look again at this uh, timeline so again we have some errors here let's correct that uh, so we have the OS kernel the hardware and the user program so we need, we need, first again initialize the trap table now in the trap table, in addition to the system call handler, we also have the timer handler. So, uh, in the demonstration I I illustrated earlier, uh, it was hooked to the interrupt request line zero. So, system handler, you know that already from the previous discussion. Then, after this setting, this the OS will start the timer so it will now start ticking and then the hardware will so start timer will is just a special instruction okay it was sending control and data bytes to the device PID then so you have a start timer and then the timer will start counting and then it will is interrupt the CPU uh, after X milliseconds so after that the next step will be uh, so here we have uh, 
So in this illustration, we have uh, process A running. Okay. So it's pro process A is running. Then while it is running, so take note that the timer is ticking while a process is running. Okay. So after some time, the hardware will generate a timer interrupt. Okay. So while process A is executing, uh, even though process A is not yet finished, a timer interrupt will happen and the hardware will need to save the registers of this process, this process A, to the kernel stack A. And then it will switch to kernel mode and then jump to the timer handler because timer interrupt was triggered. So the the OS will do the work of the timer handler. The timer inside the timer handler there will be a switch routine that will determine whether a new process will be run. So if it will run a new process, the scheduler decided to run a new process. So there will be a switch uh, routine here. What it does is to save the registers and program counter of A to the uh, process structure of uh, A and then restore the registers and program counter of B from the process structure of B and then we have the switch to the kernel stack of uh, B. So we have a switch to the kernel stack of B and from that there will be a return uh, from trap into B. So the uh, Hardware will restore the registers, program counter to B uh, of B from kernel stack of B, and then switch to user mode, and then jump to the restored PC program counter, which is B's, and then process B will now be uh, running. So that's the mechanism. Uh, of interest to us here is that the kernel stack is min maintained by the hardware this is task state segment okay and the this is the PCB okay? so we have two structures here the PCB and then we have the kernel stack. So PCB is maintained or controlled by the managed by the OS while the kernel stack is managed by the hardware in terms of x86 support. So here is an example of the context uh, switch code for uh, xv6. So as you can see uh, it's using an ATND syntax, but I'll show you uh, an example later. So, cool. so you have uh, this is the function prototype. So we have context, the old context, and the uh, new context. So you save the registers, okay. and then you load the new registers and then return. Okay. So. I'll show you the code later. So I can share the code now. So let's take a look at the switch code. So this is the code for the switching. Okay. So save all call save register, switch the stacks, and then uh, load new call save registers and return. So this is 
the actual context switch code. So that's uh, one example. Uh, regarding concurrency, Regarding concurrency, uh, okay. So what about concurrency? What happens if during an interrupt or exception handling another interrupt occurs? Okay. So the kernel is very uh, dynamic. That means a lot of changes happens all the time in its context. So it's possible that while doing an operation, an interrupt will happen. So it needs to attend to that. But uh, sometimes if you immediately handle an interrupt, some problems can happen, some inconsistencies can happen. So one technique is to disable interrupts. Okay, so usually in the x86, we have the CLI and STI instruction CLI means clear interrupts, meaning the CPU will not uh, entertain any interrupt, it cannot be interrupted. Then after that, if it cannot be interrupted, then you can uh, call STI instruction. Or another technique is to use uh, more sophisticated locking techniques like semaphores, uh, mute excess, which we will discuss uh, later. So we'll stop here and we'll continue on the next chapter later.